show at Duxford to celebrate that IWM has launched a dedicated range of Airshow 50s products which include homeware, clothing, accessories and prints including a special edition Airshow anniversary gold coin. You can also pick a copy of 50 years of Duxford Airshows, an illustrated book bookazine, an official history of Duxford Airshows featuring never before seen photographs and archive materials alongside first hand stories from the partners and individuals who returned popular flight to Duxford. This, of course, was a derelict airfield closed in um, RAF service in 1961, and for many years it was uh, falling into d d dilapidation. And uh, when you think about what, what we have here today, it's quite remarkable that we managed to secure the long-term site as Duxford as a museum, bearing in mind all of the historic events that have occurred here over the years. That's Air Shows 50, 50 years of Duxford Air Shows, and you can pick up a copy from the museum shop. haven't you because you've flown the Vampire quite a lot you've flown the Lockheed T-33 which of course is a, a derivative of the P-80 one of the very first operational jets of all 
You spent a lot of time on the F-16 fighting Falcon. You'll never find the F-35A Lightning II. How would you characterize... You don't uh, spend a lot of um, thoughts on how to fly it because the aircraft will do pretty much what you're asking it to do and you can uh, put your brain onto using it as a weapon platform. Uh, uh, bells and whistles and almost steam coming out of it where you have to turn levers and, and it, it's really, you have to fly the aircraft. It's, you really have to fly the first generation aircraft uh, and, but, but once you get them up to speed it's, it's a beautifully harmonized uh, aircraft on the controls and they just uh, perform very well considering the age uh, of the aircraft. Of course, one of the big things that modern fighter designers have attempted to do is to improve life for the pilot in terms of situational awareness in the battle space, isn't it? Um, how does that compare with the earlier jets? I mean, could you, could you imagine having taken them to war? from number 30 squadron stationed at the RAF's main air mobility hub at Bryce Norton in Oxfordshire. It's flying around several locations today in honour of Armed Forces Day which is marked today at events around the country and it's only the second time that we've seen one of these very impressive aeroplanes at a Duxford Air Show. The last time was at our big RAF 100 show in September 2018. This is a very adaptable aircraft very much at home in both the strategic and the tactical environments, known as the Airbus A400M of course by its manufacturer but named Atlas by the RAF and there are three squadrons of them at Bryce Norton, numbers 30 and 70 squadrons use the Atlas for global missions, number 24 squadron trains the crews and full operational capability in the tactical role is due now that the Atlas fleet, fleet is complete because the 22nd example was delivered from the factory in Seville on the 22nd of May this year which completes the development, delivery and production phase of the Atlas program for the RAF. And they've been very heavily involved in multinational operations in recent years. Look to your left and here comes the Airbus Atlas C1. which involved four of these aircraft as well as three of the C-130J Hercules which are now being retired, five Airbus Voyager tanker transports and seven C-17 Globemaster threes. More than 15,000 people were airlifted out by the RAF of which at least four and a half thousand were British nationals. And a very nice plan view of the aircraft as it turns in front of us and heads back in towards the airfield. We were expecting only a single pass, but it appears we're getting slightly more. is permanently deployed to the Middle East in support of British forces out there. Closer to home, they've supported the UK Border Force with maritime reconnaissance, long-range search and rescue and overwatch capabilities. Another of them is based out in the Falkland Islands, providing maritime reconnaissance, search and rescue and medical evacuation facilities. And it's able to airdrop supplies in Antarctica using the air-to-air -air refueling capability. And that mission was first performed from a Voyager, using that as the tanker platform in a trial in October 2021. So that was the number 30 squadron Atlas C1, an aircraft in well, now 
now is a good time to secure your spot to enjoy the air show, which will be starting very shortly. And your lead commentator, of course, is my big buddy, <laughs> Ben Donnell. <laughs> Thank you very much to Colin Welch, who will, of course, be with me throughout the rest of what promises to be an absolutely tremendous flying program at Duxford. We've got the debut public display of one of the most significant restorations to emerge on the UK historic aircraft preservation scene for a good many years in the form of fighter aviation engineering's Lockheed 12A. We have got some unique formations of historic aircraft. We've got plenty of Duxford favourites. We've got the quite astonishing jet pits from Rich Goodwin air shows and we've got some fly pasts to close the show from the Royal Air Force aerobatic team, the Red Arrows. It's going to be an absolutely tremendous program. Let me run through it once more for you in case you missed that earlier on. We start very shortly with the two aircraft that have taken up their positions down at the far left-hand end of the airfield, the eastern end, just undertaking power checks at the moment prior to getting airborne to form up, they being the B-17G Flying Fortress Sally B and the P-47D Thunderbolt Nelly B, a beautiful duo of US 8th Army Air Force Warbirds. Then we have Team Raven with the six Vans RV-8s. They're followed by the naval formation from the fighter collection with the Grumman Wildcat and Bearcat and the Goodyear Corsair. Then the aircraft I was just talking about, the Lockheed 12A Electra Junior, flying in a photographic reconnaissance pair with the aircraft restoration company Spitfire PR-11. Then the aerial antics of the Great War Display Team with their seven First World War replica aeroplanes. And our rotary contribution for the day from the Project Lynx team with the Westland Lynx and Gazelle. Some jet action then from the de Havilland Vampire of the Norwegian Air Force Historical Squadron and the two BAC Strike Masters of North Wales Military Aviation Services. A unique trainer combine then, training aircraft through the ages, Avro Tutor, Miles Magister, de Havilland Tiger Moth, de Havilland Chipmunk, Scottish Aviation Bulldog, Slingsby Firefly and the Pipistrel Velis Electro. And then some classic Duxford Warbird action. A trio of Spitfires, two Mark Fives and a Mark Eight, with the Hurricane Wong from Hurricane Heritage. After that, at just about 25 past three, it's time for the Rich Goodwin Air Show's Jet Pits. After that, we have the Mercury Formation, two Bristol Mercury engined aircraft, the Bristol Blenheim from the Aircraft Restoration Company, the Gloucester Gladiator returning to the circuit this year from the Fighter Collection. A beautiful pair of 1930s Beach D-17 Staggerwing biplanes to follow that up, and then a trio of Hawker Hurricanes. Beautiful formation and solo action then from the graceful Stomp SV-4 biplanes of the Stomp Formation display team. And then as we come through towards the end of the show, the Aero Supermatics Wing Walkers with the two Boeing Stearman Cadets will be entertaining us. Complete with the girls on the wings. A pair of Korean war fighters as our final full display of the day. The Hawker Fury and the North American P-51 D Mustang. And then to finish things off, a fly past or fly past. We're not quite sure at this stage how many, but nonetheless a welcome visit in advance of their full display tomorrow by the Royal Air Force Aerobatic Team, the Red Arrows, with their eight Hawks. And that takes us through until about a quarter past five. After which, as Colin was explaining to you earlier, we will of course be uh, continuing the ground activities for a good while longer until the site closes this evening. But I'll remind you about that. And one other quick reminder, while it is still rather cloudy out there, the temperatures are going to be rising over the course of the rest of the afternoon. So we do ask you please. And there, what a wonderful sight after the events of the past few weeks because there was a time when we thought this aircraft might possibly not be able to fly for us this weekend, but the magnificent work of being 17 of the engineers and the here and the US Federal Aviation Administration has allowed Boeing B-17s 
B-17G Flying Fortress Sally B to go back into the air, which it did yesterday, just in time to practice and work up for today's display. So there goes the B-17 its escort fighter, the Republic B-47D Thunderbolt, following it off the run. Thanks, Ben. Um, we don't normally do this kind of thing, but I've been handed this very nice note from Suzanne, and she says, I've organized a very special experience. So, enjoy your day here at Duxford. Very happy 70th birthday. Best wishes from not only Suzanne, of course, last night. For the first time in 2023, It was a close run thing as to whether it could happen, but thanks, as I say, to the wonderful efforts of a whole host of people and organizations, here we are, Sally B, back where it belongs, and running in to start its solo display. in very, very fine fettle indeed, thanks to the work done by the... Not by Boeing, but by the Lockheed Vega plant at Burbank, California. After its service with the US Army Air Forces and Air Force, it went on to be operated for many years by France's Institut Géographique National, the IGN, as a survey and mapping platform that was until it was brought to the UK in 1975 and this final solo pass with smoke on is always dedicated to the members of the Sally B Supporters Club whose funds have kept this aircraft flying. in Europe and as things stand it's one of only two B-17s currently flying in the world the other is in the United States and perhaps given its familiarity it's almost an airplane that we take for granted on the display circuit but I think you'll agree that the recent events have shown reminded us that that is not so. These sorts of issues can come along, so therefore your funding support is all the more crucial. When the aircraft lands and is parked up, it'll do so next to the Sally B merchandising stand. You can see two flags saying B-17 Sally B flying from there, stand down there. They will be delighted to sign you up for the supporters club or indeed to sell some of their merchandise. And there's arguably never been a better time to support Sally B than in the wake of its recent, thankfully, close-up look at a B-17. You can do so in the American Air Museum building up towards the western end of the airfield, the very distinctive one with the curved roof, where you can also see an example of the other main US Army Air Forces heavy bomber type of the Second World War, the consolidated B-24 Liberator, and compare and contrast the two four-engine heavy designs, both of which were extensively and very successfully used also by Royal Air Force Coastal Command in particular during the war years. No, Effie. Effie. Effie, give that back to Albert now, please. Sally B being flown today by Captain Andrew Dixon and as co-pilot the aircraft's chief engineer Daryl Taplin and as I say he and his colleagues really are deserving of all our thanks for the work they put in to getting this aircraft back into the skies and I think as Sally B 
taxis passed, we'd all appreciate you showing your appreciation for them, for Ellie Salingbo and everyone else who has ensured that the site we just saw was made possible again. But now diving in from the left, the Republic P-47D Thunderbolt. of the war years, the Thunderbolt, but one possessed of absolutely outstanding performance both in the air-to-air -air and the air-to-ground roles. Particularly long-range, nor that effective at low level, but with the arrival of the P-47D model like this, the design's real potential came to the fore. It was given longer range with greater fuel capacity, better cooling, various other system refinements. The addition of a turbo supercharging system in the Pratt & Whitney Double Wasp engine and the bubble canopy as opposed to the high-backed Razorback configuration on earlier P-47s also helped make this into the truly great warplane it became. In excess of 3,750 aerial kills falling to P-47s in all theatres of World War II. So, taxiing out. It's a very, very busy flying program today with takeoffs to the hold and they fly a home built aircraft. It's six examples of the Vans RV8. Together they make Team Raven for 2023. Running in in Delta formation and pulling up for the Delta Loop. Doing so on what we refer to in display terms as the A-axis. Both venues will have two display axes. The A-axis is the one parallel here to the main runway. The B-axis is at right angles to that. And the team staying in Delta formation and coming back round for an underside pass. Leading the team as Raven 1 is Simon Shirley, who's in his 10th season as a display pilot. And he comes from an RAF flying background. He has around 5,500 flying hours in his logbooks. He flew multiple tours on the Tornado F3 air defense fighter, including operationally over the Balkans in the mid-1990s. And he's been a qualified flying instructor on the Hawk, the Grock Tutor, in both the University Air Squadron and elementary flying training roles and on the current Grob G120TP prefect. And at the moment, he's a full-time reservist qualified flying instructor and air experience flight commander on the Universities of Wales Air Squadron at St. Allen, once again flying the tutor. Now 
as for the aircraft that they're flying, it really is a truly outstanding machine, the Vans RV8. One of a whole family of for pull-ups with quarter vertical rolls. And they're completing here manoeuvres known as quarter clovers, describing the outline of a quarter of a clover leaf in the sky. But rather than heading back out on the B-axis, they do so on the 45 degree line. Meanwhile, we're looking out for Ravens 1 to 4. Returning to us from the right. They have now transitioned into box formation and they're pulling up for a barrel roll. Describing the inside of a barrel lying on its side. And as they do so, we're going to get the three Navy fighters into the air underneath them. Let off by the Wildcat. Using the grass. To be followed off by the Corsair. Raven Heart, which is pierced by Raven Six. 
number six is Mark Southern. The airline pilot for some 30 years, but he flew the Tornado GR1 in the strike role and he was an instructor on the Jet Provost during his time in the RAF. He also displayed the Hunter as a civilian pilot. Four, two and three then in for the Crocodile Loops. season with the team he flies as Raven 3 now you can see the whole team getting back together as they enter from the left and this is a beautiful maneuver coming up getting into big echelon formation Ready to perform the twizzles. Putting the smoke on. And the leader leads them as they roll and fall away. But it's not going to be long before they rejoin. to pull up. They roll to the left and get ready for the downward bomb burst. And that concludes the display by the 2023 Team Raven. And as they land and roll out, they'll be taxiing back the whole length of the crowd line. We're now looking to bring in one of those sorts of formations you only really see at Duxford, out to the left and running in the three naval fighters from the fighter collection. The Grumman FM2 Wildcat and F8F2P Bearcat and the Goodyear FG1D Corsair. Except 
originally with number 802 Squadron embarked in the escort carrier HMS Audacity on convoy escort duties between Liverpool and Gibraltar. With Marklets, he shot down two of the Luftwaffe's much feared Focke-Wulf FW200 Condor maritime attack aircraft. And he called it one of the finest shipboard airplanes ever created. By contrast, the aircraft we see here, the Corsair, had its troubles early on when it came to carrier-borne operations. When this aircraft, designed by the Transport Company, and known as the F4U, when built by Transport, first appeared in 1940, it was the fastest American single-engine fighter wasn't really that great. Corsair missions went on to be flown. The type also found a very important role as a fighter bomber with the US Navy and US Marine Corps in the Pacific, supporting the various Allied amphibious landings. And the Royal New Zealand Air Force was another great Corsair exponent in both roles too. This one, as I say, in the colours of the fleet air arm, at its peak, 18 Corsair squadrons were operational with the FAA in both the European and the Pacific theatres. HMS Victorious and HMS Formidable to strike targets near Tokyo. This one built by the Goodyear firm, and it's in the colours of 1850 Squadron of the Fleet Air Arm in late 1945, serving aboard HMS Vengeance in the Pacific. Navy, the Evolutique Naval, used them extensively in Indochina, Suez, Algeria, and Tunisia. But here, running in from the left, is the Bearcat, the last of our naval trio. posing a significant threat to the Allies in the Pacific. This aircraft was developed to succeed the enormously successful F-6F Hellcat. Of a small airframe with a big engine, the 2100 horsepower Pratt & Whitney Double Wasp, which powers this airplane to a top speed in excess of 420 miles an hour. service really too late for World War II. It did enter operational use with the US Navy in May 1945, but it wasn't deployed operationally for some time and not in combat during World War II. And its pilots found it rather trickier to land aboard carriers than its predecessor, the Hellcat. One pilot took the drop like a rock without power. Under its own power. 
24 frontline squadrons of the US Navy went on to fly the Navy's aerobatic display team, the Blue Angels. Also coming in to land on the grass, meanwhile, the Corsair, which was flown by Stu Goldspink. Air Force and the Royal Thai Air Force was another user of this aircraft. Of course, they proved very, very successful unlimited air races at Reno and other places for more than 50 years. This one was among the first aircraft. It's been based at Duxford since 1984. Wears a US Navy color scheme, that of an aircraft operated by Fighter Squadron VF-20, named the Jokers. on behalf of the Secret Intelligence Service before World War II. And here it is for its first public air show display since restoration. capability with suitably equipped Spitfires. This Lockheed 12A leading this formation was the first production prototype example of the type. It made its maiden flight in 1936 and was delivered to the Continental Oil Company of Ponca City in Oklahoma. They installed a pair of 16-inch square camera ports in the bottom of F-24 reconnaissance cameras with a 10% overlap in the middle. They also added an aperture in the cabin door for a handheld F-24 or Leica 250 reporter camera and small camera ports in the wing leading edges between the engines and the fuselage, each for a single forward-facing Leica reporter. It was Cotton's assistant photographer, Patricia Martin, who devised two further modifications, a teardrop window on the port side of the cockpit, which isn't included on this aircraft today, which could act as another handheld camera position, and also, crucially, pipework to divert hot air from the engine exhausts across the lens of the... by Cotton and his regular co-pilot, a Canadian flying officer Bob Niven, and Niven's logbooks reveal the secret missions. In mid-June 1939, this very aeroplane flew to Malta, and from there, it undertook recce sorties covering key points in the Italian Empire, as far as Italian Somaliland and Libya, including they all broke out. It wasn't possible for this civilian registered aeroplane to fly in such hostile skies, but it did carry on its reconnaissance work. It flew to Ireland's west coast to check on reports of U-boats refuelling there and to photograph the Dutch and Belgian ports to test the presence or otherwise of boom defences. In September 1939, the Secret Intelligence Service flight at Heston was amalgamated into number 11 group of the Royal Air Force as the Heston flight and Cotton was commissioned as a wing commander. He was then given another innocuous sounding name, number two camouflage unit. Then in January 1940, it became the photographic development unit. And by then, the first photo recce Spitfires were active in France. Yeah. 
this aeroplane was used as a support aircraft and on SIS business, often flying to France before the armistice in 1940. Then it was damaged in Tanner and Heston when a parachute mine was dropped by a Luftwaffe aircraft on the 19th of September 1940. It was returned to the USA for repair, sold to fighter aviation engineering, and they've had it restored by air leasing at Sidewell. It made its first flight on the 27th of March this year, the first time it had flown in Britain since 1940. It was one of several Lockheed 12s associated with Sydney Cotton, who also owned a number of them post-war. But what of that link to the Spitfire? Well, it was one flying officer, Morris Shorty Longbottom, who was already something of a specialist in aerial reconnaissance, who in August 1939 issued a memorandum advocating the use of suitably modified Spitfires for photo recce work. It predated similar recommendations by Sidney Cotton, who later came to fall out of favour with the RAF by some weeks. The first reconnaissance Spitfires were a pair of Mark 1s, modified with a downward-facing 5-inch F-24 camera, and it was Longbottom himself who undertook their first sortie out of lille seclin on the 18th of November 1939. That and further PR Spitfire Mark 1s were very active over France in the months that followed. And so it went on from there. And while Cotton departed the photographic development unit in June 1940, the concept had then been proved, and it was improved upon by successive marks of reconnaissance Spitfire. <laughs> These aircraft were mostly unarmed, used, able to use their speed and altitude performance to evade enemy attentions. And this PR-11 was the most numerous of all the wartime PR Spitfire marks. 471 of them were built. Before and around the D-Day period, they provided images to make the photo mosaic maps used for planning the invasion, used for target intelligence, for tactical and heavy bombers, for coverage of the landing beaches and glider landing sites that would be used on D-Day, for the locations of German coastal defences around Normandy and of V-1 flying bomb launch sites. to his secretary, Patricia Martin, devised a shade known as camo tint, the exact shade of which and the exact colour of which have proved very hard to ascertain. It is a quite superb restoration by air leasing. And as I said earlier, this has to be one of the most significant aeroplanes to appear on the British historic aircraft circuit for a good long while. Now, incredibly, this is one of five Lockheed 12As airworthy in Europe, another of which, owned by Antoine Chabert in France, is one of Cotton's post-war Lockheed 12As. Wouldn't it be nice at some point to see them together? Pandemic, it raised more than £130,000 for NHS charities together. And it used to carry the legend, thank you, NHS, on its wing underside. Well, that's now been removed, but you can still see the donor's signatures hand-applied to the aircraft, and they'll stay there for the rest of this season. Paul Bonhomme was flying the Spitfire PR-11 from the Aircraft Restoration Company, and what a treat that was. The reconnaissance pair, Lockheed 12A and Spitfire. Switches from World War II and pre-World War II photographic reconnaissance to the battlefields of the First World War with the presentation from our great friends from the Great War display team. And Deb Poddington joins me to help talk through it. Deb's a very warm welcome to you. Good to have you back at Duxford. Thank you very much, Ben. 
just a quick one for anybody with children to let you know there are pyros with this display, so there will be some quite loud bangs and flashes. What you're about to see above you is what you are diving at the very close formations. The black smoke was known as Akak, or better known as Charlie. Now the Charlie, the white was the British and the black was the German. As we can see, the CLK is right on the tail of the Avro 504. Much more manoeuvrable than the Avro 504. It's just one monoplane type in this display, the Yunker CL-1, which was a very late World War I design, intended as a ground attack aircraft. It wasn't flown, the CL-1, until December 1917. By contrast, the Avro 504 that it's pursuing made its maiden flight in 1913, and nearly 9,000 of them had been produced by the end of World War I, which was more than any other aircraft settling air airship factories in Friedrichshafen on Lake Constance in what's often been considered the world's first air strategic bombing raid so as they clear out to the right look in front of you because the other aircraft are flying into all of the trenches and there goes the ACAC and if you can imagine now this is what the soldiers in the trenches would be seeing above them it's a very iconic look breaking away high there, the two SE-5As. The SE-5A with the streamers on it, the streamers were there to denote that was the leader of the squadron. And the two aircraft in the lowest orbit in front is the Newport 17 Scout, and behind it one of the two very, very recognisable Fokker DR-1 triplanes, the Dreideckers. The triplane with the red snake on the fin is owned by Pete Bond, who built it himself. And the one with the black snake on it is Will Greenwood, and this was the airplane that was formerly owned by Bruce Dickinson of Iron Maiden fame. You can now see the SE5 in the front with a, very clearly with the streamers on him. SE in that aircraft's designation stands for Scout Experimental. SE-5s and SE-5As were used during the war by 21 British Royal Empire squadrons and two American units. More than 5,000 of them went on to be built. It was a good performer at all altitudes. It was quicker than its German rivals. It was very strong, fast and agile. this display is how inexperienced a lot of the First World War pilots were because while there are many famous names to have emerged from that conflict on both sides, these were very young men who had undergone by modern standards certainly very rudimentary training. Well, certainly Ben, a lot of them would only have eight hours or less in uh, flying time and of course it didn't help that uh, quite often they would crash the aeroplanes before they even got as far as the battlefield. If their average age on entering the front line during World War One was just 20, and then they were thrust into the melee of incredibly close in dogfights, often at altitude, and they wouldn't even have oxygen supply. No, not at all. And I think a lot of the aeroplanes, unfortunately, as I said, never made it as far as the battlefield, because with them all being mainly single seaters as well, they didn't even have any chance for instruction. in German terms, the Fokker DR-1 was really the most famous fighter, at least certainly now, of the 
First World War, it was developed in significant part as a result of the excellent performance of the Sopwith triplane when that British aircraft first appeared. Armed with two Spandau machine guns, 320 of them only were built, a very small number in fact, by contrast with the likes of the FE-58, certainly the 504. It was very agile in turns, but it was slower than its allied adversaries, and it suffered some quite serious structural problems at the time as well. sky today is actually creating the perfect backdrop to this display. It makes it look very much more real. And those real dogfights of the First World War would have involved mostly far, far more aircraft than this, jockeying for position, very often using the rudder to make turns. Yes, as much as this looks like it's mayhem, I can assure you it's a very well orchestrated display. You may have seen the guys earlier walking it out on the ground, and they do that on a regular basis. Well, coming past us now, one of the triplanes has got the new Part 17 firmly in its sights. This is a very interesting aircraft indeed. It's a so-called sesquiplane, or one-and-a-half-wing neck design, whereby one wing, which is the lower one in this case, is smaller than the other. When it was first introduced by the French air arm, the Aeronautique Militaire, it proved well able to take on the hitherto dominant German Fokker E3 Eindecker monoplane. And many French and British aces flew Newport Scouts, as well as the American volunteer manned Escadrille Lafayette with its famous Indian head emblem, which is worn on this replica. The Newports were also flown not just against enemy fighter and bomber aircraft, but highly successfully against enemy observation balloons. with the Great War team all come from a large variety of backgrounds. Some fly with general aviation, we have some airline pilots and engineers, so a lot of background there. So for those of you watching, I don't know if you worked out yet who's winning. I'm not sure that I can see yet. say, of course, all of these aircraft are replicas, some full-size, others the SE-5As, small-scale, 7 8 scale replicas, and all of them use more modern engines than the types that would have been employed on these aircraft in the period. But nonetheless, it is the most tremendous recreation of the sort of whirling melee that would have been seen above the trenches. For the photographers of you, um, make sure you get the pictures of the Avro, because unfortunately this may be the last season that the Avro 504 will be flying. Um, it's actually owned by um, Mr. Avro's grandson, and I think they made the decision now that, unless we can get some sponsorship for it, unfortunately it will be dedicated to a museum early next year. It's a very interesting replica, isn't it? Built originally out in Argentina by a company called Pursan. It certainly is. It came back to this country and I believe went to um, the Yankees, somewhere else, and then uh, my brother got it and rebuilt it. Well, the aircraft now, as you can see, forming up out to our right for their final pass, and 
And with this, we pay tribute to the aviators of all countries who took part in the First World War in the air. And also, please give them away because I can see you as they come by. round of applause as I think they do a fabulous show. The Great War team, ladies and gentlemen. So who do we have flying today, Debs? So in the two SE5s we have John Gamage and Dave Linney. In the Avro 504 is Matthew Boddington. In the Newport is John Gilbert. And in the two Fokker triplanes, Pete Bond and Will Greenwood. And the Junkers CL1? Sorry, poor Mike, I always forget him. <laughs> Mike Collett. Ah, yes, of course. Who we'll be seeing later on in another rather more potent aeroplane. In the Hurricane, I believe. Yes, yes Ben. Absolutely. Well, thank you very much, Debs. We look forward to uh, seeing the team again tomorrow and hearing from you later when we have the Wing Walkers. Thanks, Ben. positioning out to land behind the Great War display team. In turn, we have one of the stars of today's show in from another commitment elsewhere. It's an aircraft we actually had with us last year at the Duxford Summer Air Show, but not in this configuration. It's Rich Goodwin's muscle pit, which has now become his jet pit. We'll see the jet engines engaged when he does his show later on. of trainers starting up on the grass flight line. The chipmunk is already running, already taxied, and in fact is starting its takeoff roll. That's the vampire.
alongside a huge array of current and other former Aeronautica Militare types. But this is the first time we've seen it in the UK in these colours this summer. And Martin Tesley from the Norwegian Air Force Historical Squadron uh, joins me now. Uh, Martin, this is a very meaningful scheme, isn't it, on the Vampire Squadron? Absolutely. So uh, we have uh, put up the uh, Italian uh, markings uh, for this year since the Italians are celebrating a 100 year uh, of uh, their Air Force and it's uh, very uh, fitting to have uh, the uh, Italian markings with an Italian squadron that uh, is currently uh, existing in Italy today. That's the 154th uh, Gruppo, or squadron, of the 6th Stormo, or wing, named Diavoli Rossi, or Red Devils, which operated vampires from 1952 until they converted to the Republic F-84F a few years later. Now Martin, you've got plenty of hours on this aeroplane. Everyone says it's an absolute delight to fly. Is it as nice as everyone reckons? Yes, it is. And Kenneth is now going into a loop, and one of the things that's so remarkable with the Vampire is that it's uh, energy efficient, and he, he will almost gain energy even through this loop that he's now maneuvering through. So it's a very delightful aircraft to fly, uh, and very nimble on the controls once you get it up to speed, and uh, it's uh, truly just a, a nice airplane that uh, handles uh, very, very harmonically. So it's easy for you then to see why this aircraft was used by the RAF's first ever jet aerobatic teams. Yes, it was uh, used by the uh, first uh, aerobatic team. Uh, there were not that many jets to choose from, but uh, of the ones that they could choose, this one was really a very good um, uh, aircraft to use for that type of uh, uh, displaying. Uh, and uh, it's, it's just uh, one very nice airplane to be flying formation with. Full for the post-war Royal Norwegian Air Force. Yes, so the uh, Vampire was um, the uh, aircraft that Norway got as the, uh, the first uh, uh, fighter jet uh, and uh, also led the Norwegian Air Force into the jet age uh, and uh, it was uh, used in the Norwegian Air Force for six years as the fighter aircraft for Norway. from the Shuttleworth Collection, the first of our training slot to get airborne. said comparable performance and you're going to see that they are uh, quite uh, similar in performance as they're now going to perform a loop um, so they're going to be uh, able to do that within the same uh, performance specter of uh, these three aircraft So 
uh, approximately three and a half to four thousand feet at the top of the loop. doing the, uh, the uh, air display over in Finland and it's also uh, uh, used uh, at the Finnish test pilot school as the uh, aircraft uh, for their final exam where they will fly an aircraft uh, and evaluate an aircraft that they have never flown before. So uh, it's uh, over in Finland right now and will be there for another week. So 70 plus year old aeroplanes still working alongside a modern military. I think that's tremendous. In for the break. North Wales Military Aviation Service Racers. They look after numerous jet provosts as well. The Strike Master being a light attack development of the very popular JP. But in over the M11 threshold comes the Vampire FB6 of the Norwegian Air Force Historical Squadron, flamed by Kenneth Orkvisla as the two Strike Masters. So did South Yemen, but most particularly there was Omar. The Sultan of Omar stationed to support ground troops that much more rapidly, and of course its armament was far more potent. It could carry 32 Sura rockets or 16 of those and a pair of 540-pound bombs as well as the two.
heading straight towards us for the final manoeuvre of their display. And those lights very visible against the clouds. With smoke on, Sean Trudenshin calls them to pull up. And this is going to be their final split. So, Sean Tradition and Ian Busters. But in this year that 504K earlier on was part of the Great War display team, well, let's continue that story now. As heading in from the left, we have a real gaggle of different trainers beginning in the between the walls years and leading them through is the Avro Tutor from the Shuttleworth Collection, the world's only airworthy example of this biplane trainer type. Then we have a mix of interwar and wartime biplane and monoplane trainers with the Havilland DFJ 2A Tiger Moth and the Miles Magister. And then we come into the post-war years with the Havilland Canada Chipmunk T10, the Scottish Aviation Bulldog T1 and the Slingsby T67 and 260 Firefly being rapidly caught up by the British Rail Danish Electro, the first all electric aircraft that we ever have to display at the Bradford Show. because the fighter pilots would be flying aircraft of that period and they were all tail draggers and they're harder to handle on the ground very often than they are in the air. using the stick. Well, in fact, with a Tiger Moth, you very much have to use the rudder as well. And if you're landing in a tail dragger, such as a Tiger Moth, it's very easy to do a ground loop. If the wind catches you and you're not awake, which is what I was talking about, an aircraft mustn't be too benign as a trainer, because it'll... Uh, Eventually, it will bite you if you if you just let it run away with itself. It's always something which requires a very positive touch on the controls, really, to demonstrate, you know, to, to separate those pilots out who might be, you know, worthy of moving on to something bigger and more powerful. Absolutely, that's right. And what we're talking about here, of course, is the, the stages of training that a, that a pilot during the 1930s and 40s would go through. This is very much at the lower echelon. And from here, we move on to much more powerful, yes. more, more like um, the hardwoods. Indeed. They would also be training in what would be um, quite calm conditions. Now we're into the post-war period. We'll be coming back to the Avro Tutor shortly, but cavorting in front of us, we've got the glorious handling, the Havilland Canada Chipmunk. We've then got the Scottish Aviation Bulldog, which largely replaced the Chipmunk, and the Slingsby Firefly, which actually had a hand in replacing both. Yes, and now we're moving forward quite a bit because now we have a, a nose wheel. 
one, two of the three aircraft, at the very, at yeah. the very least, yes. And the, uh, the Chipmunk was designed as a Tiger Moth successor for both the RAF and the Royal Canadian. Wartime types carried on, but very soon the Chipmunk picked up and became, again, almost as much of a legend as the Tiger Moth. And of course, famously, uh, Prince an aircraft that still uh, survives in flying condition over at uh, Old Warden. And of course, now there are lots of the tell that story right into the 21st century, because while the chipmunk was retired by the RAF in 1996 with its last operators, some of the air experience flights, which fly members of the air cadets, the Scottish Aviation Bulldog took over from the Chipmunk with the University Air Squadrons and then it replaced the Bulldog with the Air Experience flights as well. That's the other red and white aircraft in this formation, the one nearest to us as they come past. The Bulldog in turn was replaced by the Croc Tutor, which we had hoped to have in today's display, which unfortunately due to a fleet white grounding at the moment is an aircraft with a great Duxford connection. This was the successor to the Avro 504. It was known at the time as an all-metal aircraft. What that actually meant in the 1930s was a uh, steel and aluminium alloy structure rather than wood, but still with the fabric covering. A small batch was ordered for service trials, and by late 1931, tutors with both Mongoose and Lynx 4 engines built by Armstrong Sidley were in service with number three flying training school. The RAF decided to choose the tutor while early problems with the Tiger Moth were ironed out and the RAF college and the central flying school brought them into use in numbers during 1933 and they served with a large number of university air squadrons as well. One of those was the Cambridge University Air Squadron which was based here at RAF Duxford and some years ago the IWM spoke to a former Cambridge University Air Squadron instructor, one Joseph Cox, about the type of students he encountered here at Duxford between the wars. They were all jolly nice, the only one way to describe them, really nice young gentlemen. One to all of them was a bit wild, but uh, I meant wild in a nice way, in a very nice way. They were, they were, but, but when it came down to the flying, they were, they were very, they were, I thought, excellent, excellent. I can't remember, I had a heck of a lot on, and I, I think I showed you that list of them, I had a whole um, list of them, um, and I, I can't think of one that really could cause me uh, any trouble, um, conduct-wise I'm not talking about, I mean, uh, one or two of them were more difficult to teach to fly than, than others, but then... Now this is a product of the Slovenian-based Pipistrel company. It already developed the world's first two-seat electric aircraft, the Taurus Electro, which flew in 2007. The Velis Electro is based on the conventionally engined Virus aircraft. It's a side-by-side -side two-seater, largely composite construction, incredibly light. Its maximum takeoff weight is just 600 kilos. And of course, while it's in operation, it has zero emissions and a noise level of just 60 decibels. Top speed just under 100 knots, ceiling of 12,000 feet, and it has 50 minutes of endurance. And Pipistrel also produces both the electric power plant and its battery, which rather takes us back to when Dowell used to build both engines and airframes, as we'll see when we see the Tiger Moth coming past us again. The silence is broken, meanwhile, by our three Spitfires getting airborne from the grass, two Mark Vs and the Mark VIII. Here is training through the years personified. Tiger Moth Magister, 
chipmunk, bulldog, firefly. chasing them through. Avoidable circumstances with a technical problem that's recently been affecting that fleet to bring things up to date as far as the RAF is concerned, but a glimpse into the future with the Velis Electro. First of them to land is the Slingsby Firefly, this fantastic, very, very aerobatically capable 260 horsepower version, operated by Anglian Flight Centres from Earls Cone in Essex and flown here by Nigel Wilson. civilian market. Only one military operator still believed to be flying the Bulldog, which is the Lebanese Air Force. Kenya and Malta also soldiered on with the Bulldog, but they've now retired them. This one privately owned by Mike Miles, who keeps it at Audley End, just down towards Stansted, with Clive Denny flying it today. And that classic shape of the chipmunk. This one also based at Audley End with the Chippy Sierra Yankee group and Phil Hardesty, who coordinated this whole trainer sequence, flying that. Then we've got the Velis Electro with Sam Watmo at the controls, which, as I mentioned before, the display. Spent some time here at Duxford in the 1970s, at the time the museum was first opening to the public when it was owned as a, a hulk by the East Anglian Aviation Society, but now absolutely immaculate. Now we're looking out for one of the types of display that again a Duxford show would hardly be complete without. And the sound of Rolls Royce Merlin powering a trio of Supermarine Spitfires and a single Hawk Hurricane. Our Merlin formation in from the right.
them have incredibly notable combat histories to their name and the fourth was flown by one of Britain's most markings it now wears in that's just taxing past us here at the control tower the other Spitfire 5 E602 from fighter aviation engineering completed in excess of 100 missions including escorting the original B17 named Memphis Bell back to the United this while that Spitfire was in service with number 129 squadron and the Hurricane 1 there, R4118. Well, that aircraft, during the Battle of Britain, flew 49 sorties out of Croydon in service with number 605 County of Warwick Squadron, during which it either shot down or damaged five Luftwaffe aircraft. The other Spitfire, meanwhile, the very rare Mark 8C, was delivered to the first of its RAF units by a female air transport auxiliary pilot named Mary Wilkins, later Mary Ellis, who on numerous occasions before her death was reunited with the sequence. We had Nick Smith in the Fighter Collections Spitfire 5, Gabriel Barton in the Fighter Aviation Engineering Spitfire 5, Martin Overall in the Mark 8 Spitfire owned by Max Alpha Aviation, and lastly James Brown, the founder of Hurricane Heritage, which now owns this Hurricane in the Mark 1 R4118. Thank you to all of them. Not the last Hurricane we'll be seeing on today's programme. We have three more that will be performing for us later, but now something very new and very different for the air show circuit in 2023. Extra the temperatures endured by the tailplane and containment of turbines in case of a rotor burst and of course all the structural analyses as well. But there's Rich going straight into his display on the knife edge at very low level. has absolutely 
proved to be just what Rich and Eddie hoped it would be. A unique aircraft on the European air show circuit with air show entertainment in mind. Here we see it describing a very, very wide inverted circle. for a moment. He does this at various intervals during his display just to cool things off in readiness for some of the Well that is again just absolutely incredible and it's not the last time he's going to attempt to bring things to a stop
repositions for his next manoeuvres, the Bristol Mercury engined aircraft are rolling off the grass, the Bristol Blenheim and the Gloucester Gladiator. one of the prime RAF frontline aircraft when war was declared against Germany in September 1939. In fact, on the 3rd of September, the day war broke out, more Blenheims were in RAF service nearly 1,100 of them than any other type. And the earliest RAF actions of World War II include, involved Mark IV Blenheims. The one we see here is in Mark IF, fighter configuration. The number 139 Squadron Blenheim flying out of RAF Witten near Huntingdon on a reconnaissance sortie by flying officer McPherson became the first British aircraft to overfly Germany after the start of World War II. And there's a nice symmetry here in seeing the Blenheim in the same show as we've seen the Lockheed 12A Electra Junior in earlier on. Because, once again, you can trace the line through from the covert operations of the Lockheed 12 and of another aircraft type that we're shortly to see represented in the display through to the RAF, then assuming the reconnaissance role over Germany once war broke out.
The first bomber command raid of hostilities came the following day, the 4th of September 1939. Aircraft from RAF Watersham in Suffolk attacked the German fleet in port at Wilhelmshaven. Their losses were appalling and it wasn't the last time that that could be said about operations by Bristol Blenheims because an aircraft that had been extremely fast only two or three years before was now highly vulnerable to enemy fighters. It's an aircraft that has a little bit of a Duxford connection. They were briefly based here in Mark 1F fighter form, like we see here, with number 222 Squadron, protecting channel shipping. That unit then converted to Spitfire. The Costa Gladiator. aircraft taking off as Rich Goodwin was hovering the jet pits above it because there's a certain design similarity between the standard as opposed to Rich's very modified pit special and the Gladiator, a close coupled biplane for very different purposes of course but you can see what I mean if you were to see a, a standard example of a pit. This aircraft was the first RAF fighter to enter service with an enclosed cockpit, but perhaps more pertinently, it was the RAF's last new biplane fighter. It was only bought as an interim measure, pending development of the new monoplanes, the Hurricanes and the Spitfires. Once again, as with the Blenheim, Gladiator crews flew significantly against the odds. The most famous exploits are those of the Hal Far fighter flight at Hal Far in Malta, a flight of sea gladiators. Just the famous three that later became known largely for propaganda purposes by the names Faith, Hope and Charity. Nonetheless, gladiators on the Mediterranean island put up a really dogged defence during 1940. That they were admittedly more effective against the biplanes that the Italians were still flying in that theatre than against the more modern German and Italian monoplanes. This aircraft restored it to fly and it took to the air in 2008, made its public debut here five years later. But it's displaying today, and this is its last pass for the first time since 2017. Clyde Cessna and Lloyd Stearman, but then in 1932 he set up his own company, Beechcraft, and with his designer Ted Wells, whom he brought across from Travel Air, they conceived the Model 17, a fast executive biplane, as their first design. It was a bit of a gamble at a time when the Great Depression had very much taken hold, coming just three years after the Wall Street crash, but Beach saw the potential. The two-seat hurricane now rolling off the grass, incidentally. This design became forever known as the Staggerwing, the name coined 
as a nickname never officially when it first appeared in public. This is because the upper wing, as you'll see very clearly, had a fixed undercarriage. They then changed it to a retractable one, which already improved this aeroplane from really outstanding aerodynamics, giving it very clean surface as a nose. Space. Well, all of that was achieved on this aircraft, the Beach D-17S, and here running in over the motorway. We've got two of them. in the States at the time cost somewhere around $6,000. This aircraft was not cheap. The base model cost $14,000 when it first came out. Perhaps unsurprisingly, therefore, the sales were quite slow to pick up, but soon the stagger wing dominated the market. One of its on that occasion really were very useful indeed. Now, the two aircraft we've got here both have their own excellent histories. The one in the lead in the military camouflage scheme is owned by Peter Kuipers and is based at Leopoldsburg in Belgium. It was produced for the US Army Air Forces and it was supplied, it also served with the Royal Navy Station Flight at Heston where the Lockheed 12A of fighter aviation engineering that we had earlier on was also based. Although, of course, they weren't ever there at the same time because the Lockheed was returned to the USA after it was damaged in 1940, and this staggering dates from 1944. It's now painted as the personal aircraft of His Royal Highness Prince, His Royal Highness Prince Bernhard of the Netherlands, who operated a staggering while he was exiled in London from 1941 to 45. Operation Bolton Platter raid on Evair Airfield near Brussels on the 1st of January 1945. But this aircraft has long been in these colours for very many years while it was operated by the great warbird collector Ross Lamplough. And it's been retained in these markings in the ownership of, appropriately enough, Dutchman Peter Carabas. from Peter Kuypers in his own stagger wing and Nigel Wilson flying the Maroon One owned by Jeffrey Lynch. As I mentioned a little while ago, only one of our three Hurricanes able to take up. He'll be flying it tomorrow. So he was after a suitable display and touring aeroplane. This absolutely fitted the bill, and it was returned to airworthiness for him by Transal Aero Services at Midden Ceyland in the Netherlands, and it flew again towards the end of 2021 after many years on the ground, but in perfect condition. The second aircraft here, meanwhile, was also built for the US Army Air Forces. After World War II, it went off to Hurricane, flying anywhere in the world. Should be very short. An aircraft that's painted as a hurry bomber version of the Hurricane, the Mark II, flown by 174 Squadron at Manston in Kent in 1942, which served during the disastrous Allied amphibious landings in Dieppe that year. Newly converted by the type experts, Hawker Restorations, and their new facilities at
coming in from the left to start his display, the two-seat Hurricane. the satellite station yeah so more of that then if you're coming back tomorrow we will tell you all about the contribution those pilots made and about the specific markings worn on the HAC Hurricane and indeed the Providence in relation to another prominent pole who flew during the combat of the summer of 1940 of the aircraft owned by Jennifer Taylor Mike Collett was flying the Hurricane display for us solo today in Hurricane Heritage's two-seater. And as you can see, they very kindly smoked the airfield out for us. As they climb for height, their first maneuver will be a formation loop. So if you watch carefully, as soon as the smoke goes on, that's when they'll come down into the loop. Our pilots today are Dave Barrell in the lead aeroplane and Brian Corns. Dave has been with the team now since 2006 and this is about his 16th um, air display season. He's done over 1400 air shows. Brian Corns originally started on gliders, then went into the Air Force and he's flown most aeroplanes from gliders right up to executive airliners.
And smoke is on and any minute now down they'll come into the first manoeuvre which is a formation loop and here we go so on the dive into this loop they're doing about 150 miles an hour and at the bottom the girls are pulling about 4g so if you can imagine that means the girls are feeling four times heavier than you would do normally into a stack. The rig they use is unique to Aerosuperbatics. Nobody else has a rig that works like this. It has a pin that holds it upright for normal um, flying or when they're doing the uh, public wing walking, but the girls take the pin out and that's when they can move the rig around. They also have a safety wire on which is attached to the aeroplane by a carabiner. And coming towards us now, you can see the girls are sideways in the rigs. Come into the stack, and then as they come towards us, they will split. two wing walkers today are Kirsty and Emma. Kirsty's been with Aero Superbatics for the last six years. She started off as an aerial circus performer, so is well um, to do all of these manoeuvres. Her favourite time is when she's actually climbing round the aeroplane, not actually attached to the harness. Emma has done a couple of years with us and she has done gymnastics and ballet and once again very well um, able to do these manoeuvres but believe you me it is extremely hard work on top of those aeroplanes you're working really really hard Now come forward onto the B axis and do the brake as they come towards the crowd. So if you've got your camera handy, get ready with the photographs. And off they go to the split. now come back round again and do a series of opposition passes for us so again get ready with the cameras because there'll be a good photo opportunity also please put your hands in the air now once again girls are sideways in the rigs you can see they've moved around yet again they're coming in for an opposition pass Closely, you'll see them swing back round to uh, normal standing position again. And now they're actually upside down in the rigs again. You see with the toes nicely pointed. Very odd feeling. Aeroplanes right way up, you're upside down.
uh, sideways on the wrecks. So this is a good opportunity again. Put your hands in the air and give them a wave as they're coming straight down the crowd line. will slow down slightly and this will give the two wing walkers on the top the chance to actually climb down and you will see them they will be sitting on the front of the aeroplane so completely out of the rigs just sitting on the front of the aeroplane Okay, so it looks like that's the next pass, not this one. I think we'll find this time they're coming in and we'll get a nice roll coming through. Up they go. And over the top, and in fact the girls are upside down in the rig, so that must feel really peculiar. As you can see, they're now sitting on the front of the aeroplanes. They've actually climbed out of the rigs and are sitting right on the front of the aeroplane. And with a so as they come in for their last pass, please give them a huge wave and a huge round of applause. Ladies and gentlemen, Aerosuperbatics.
Bristol Centaurus 18. In contrast, of course, the P51D Mustang using the Packard built V1650 version of the Rolls Royce Merlin. units aboard three Royal Navy carriers and one of the Royal Canadian Navy. Mustangs by then designated not as P-51s but as F-51s were flown in the Korean theatre by the Republic of Korea Air Force, the Royal Australian Air Force and the South African Air Force. Korea, while the jets tended to fly with rather longer transit times to the combat areas from airfields in Japan. committed to the UN efforts in Korea. Again, the RAF contributions being short Sunderland flying boat stationed in Japan and Oster AOP-6 air observation post aircraft flown on behalf of the Army. The Fleet Air Arms contribution, therefore, much more substantial, and it was to the Navy that the only British... It's now generally regarded that Lieutenant Brian Ellis was the Sea Fury pilot who claimed that notable coup de grace.
and as so many Mustangs did after the P-51 replaced the P-47 Thunderbolt with the 78th fighter group, the Duxford Eagles, at the end of 1944, beginning of 1945, a Mustang settles down onto the grass here, and that one flown by John Dodd. That Mustang's famous blue nose scheme representing the Bogney based unit that it served with showing up absolutely beautifully now in this glorious early evening light and we just await the arrival of the Fury which is owned by Fighter Aviation Engineering this afternoon there are links to the A1, the A10, the A11, the A14 and the M11 on the outskirts of Royston, which is just about uh, five or six miles away. If you park in our north car park, which is located, located over the Bailey Bridge, all the cars will be turned left when you leave this afternoon. Please don't go around the route park of the motorway that travel north and left exit, then take the end to the uh, 8 route to Royston. Most importantly, do drive carefully. And we hopefully will see you back here tomorrow for another repeat performance. Ben, it's been a lot of fun today. It really has. Thank you very much, Colin. We ought to remind people if they're not able to rejoin us tomorrow, some of the next events taking place here, because the next of our flying days is coming soon. And this one is entitled The Americans, paying tribute to the shared Second World War history of British and American forces in the flying displays with aircraft such as the B-17, the P-47, several Piper Cubs and more. They're free to IWM members. You can still